Did Samuel speak to King Saul after he died? What a question! But at some point we might as well address this subject and weigh in. Of course, as soon as I pick a side in this argument, I know that I will disappoint half of you. But no one said all Bible believers have to agree on every detail. So let's set the stage. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 28, the prophet Samuel dies, and King Saul wishes he could ask the prophet some advice in the upcoming war with the Philistines. So he begins a search for someone who could help him contact the dead prophet. And because the Bible strictly forbids this kind of activity, some Christians teach that when Saul takes part in some witchcraft to communicate with the dead, that it must have been a demonic evil spirit impersonating the prophet Samuel. And 99% of the time I would agree with those Christians and declare that it's impossible to truly communicate with the dead, but there's just a few nagging problems with this theory. For those of you that aren't familiar with what we are talking about, in the book of 1 Samuel, we find the prophet Samuel anointing the first king of Israel. The king is named Saul, and he's from the tribe of Benjamin. And the nation of Israel was happy to get a king because they sadly wanted to be like the other nations. So deep down, you knew things were going to go from bad to worse. In fact, things get off to such a bad start that some modern versions of the Bible trip over the beginning of King Saul's reign. We start off with chapter 13, verse 1, where it says, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. Now, did you have any trouble understanding that? Nope. He reigned for a year, and pretty much nothing was recorded, kind of an uneventful year, and now we've moved into his second year as king. This verse never gave anybody any trouble for years and years. But let's see what the modern versions do with this supposedly difficult passage that has probably been stunting your spiritual growth all of these years over the staggering doctrine of one year or two. Up first is the Amplified Bible. Apparently, when people don't understand you, you just need to raise your voice and yell at them with some good amplification. So, the Amplified says, Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. Hmm. All of a sudden, the Amplified became concerned with how old Saul was. Up next is the New English Bible that said Saul was 50 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel for 22 years. Boy, that's sure different. Next is the New American Standard Bible that says Saul was 40 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 32 years over Israel. So the New American Standard disagrees with the New English Bible, and so Saul is back to being 40, I guess. And I know a lot of Christians, personally, that tell me I should use the New American Standard, but I like to ask them, which one? Because in 1995, they came out with a different New American Standard, and apparently they fixed Saul's age down to 30 years old instead of 40 and that he reigned 42 years instead of 32. I guess this is good news for Saul, and he's getting younger, but next comes up the New International Version, which also says he was 30, so maybe they're finally going to settle on this number. I was starting to feel like they'd say he was 20 or something. Then we have the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible with its New World Order translation, that's what I like to call it, that says Saul was blank, blank, blank years old when he became king, and for two years he reigned over Israel. Now, I'm not sure when you quote that verse, if you're supposed to say dash, 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 or dot, 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 but you won't take the Jehovah's Witnesses seriously, right? But you'd take the Revised Standard Version, wouldn't you? And it's joined by its lovely disciple, the ESV, and they say Saul was dash, dash, dash years old when he began to reign, and he reigned, dash, 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 and two years over Israel. What an embarrassment. Now, after the ESV came out, we King James Bible believers made fun of them, and the ESV realized that we called them out for hero-worshiping the RSV, so they boldly said to themselves, we've got to change that or we'll be laughed at. So they wiped the slate clean 
and put their super duper scholarly brains together and came up with Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, I marvel at the fact that someone got paid for coming up with that. But what about the good news for modern man? The good news for modern man, also called the Good News Bible, and it's also called today's English version. Apparently, they can't decide what to call themselves. And when it comes to indecision, nobody holds a candle to them because when they print chapter 13, they don't even attempt to tell us what it should say. They leave it blank and start the chapter with verse 2. And to think this version was recommended by Billy Graham. But before we get back to the prophet Samuel, let's tie up this rabbit trail with one last punchline. Remember the New American Standard and how it disagreed with itself? Well, when they get to Acts chapter 13, they let the cat out of the bag when they admit that Saul was king for 40 years, not 32 or 42. And these knuckleheads think they can talk you out of your perfect Bible for one of theirs. Anyway, King Saul ends up making a mess of things, so much so that God tells the prophet Samuel that he's all through with King Saul, and King Saul gets nervous and ends up tearing the mantle of Samuel. So King Saul goes through a period of time where there's no more communication with God, and he can't even confide with the prophet Samuel. He's in a real communication blackout. And to make matters worse, the prophet Samuel dies. And now King Saul gets even more depressed as the Philistines are getting ready to attack Israel. And Saul is desperate for some guidance, so he asks his servants to find a witch that works with familiar spirits. Of course, earlier in King Saul's reign, he outlawed anybody performing such witchcraft, so it will be a bit difficult to locate someone now. But King Saul's servants know of a witch that can help. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and the two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits, and the wizards, out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And this is where all the trouble begins among us Christians. Some Christians say that that couldn't have been Samuel because Samuel is dead. And the Bible forbids communicating with the dead. This is the teaching of J. Vernon McGee. I happen to have his commentary on First and Second Samuel. And he teaches that this spirit that is conjured forth is not Samuel. Now, I'm not going to say bad things about Brother McGee's teaching on this, except that I politely disagree, but he's not the only one that feels that way. Matthew Henry wrote a very large commentary, and he feels that this was an evil spirit impersonating Samuel based on the spirit coming up. This is a result of not rightly dividing the scriptures like you are supposed to do. Matthew Henry says that Samuel would have been a good guy, so he would have had to come down from heaven. So based on this, it can't be Samuel. And Brother Henry would be correct if this had happened after the cross. As this very detailed image shows us, as you can tell, I spare no expense to give you the very best graphics. Anyway, as Jesus explains to us when he told us about the rich man in hell, looking across over into Abraham's bosom, where he sees Abraham and Lazarus. I've made a dotted line to indicate the rich man in hell lifting up his eyes and seeing Abraham. This was going on in the heart of the earth as Jesus hadn't died on the cross at this point. Now we are living in a time after the cross, when after three days and three nights, Jesus took those Old Testament saints out of there and on to heaven. So now, as of Jesus leaving the tomb, when the rich man lifts up his eyes, 
He doesn't see the Old Testament saints because today they aren't there. Now, in our current age, when a Christian dies, their spirit goes to be with the Lord. So when Samuel said, why did you bring me up? He would have been talking correctly from a directional point of view. Picking up in the narrative where we left off at verse 13, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. That would be the mantle that Saul grabbed and it tore. And So he recognizes Samuel at this point, and Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Now take a look closely at that first sentence. According to the Bible, you know, the word of God, who is speaking? The Bible says Samuel. It doesn't say, then the evil spirit, pretending to be Samuel, said. As you go through this whole chapter, it's Samuel said this, and Samuel said that. And brethren, nowhere else in the Bible does it ever go back and clarify anything different to us. Here's the next verse. Note who the Bible continues to say is still talking. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from me, and has become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth, and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day, nor all the night. Once again, notice who the Bible is giving credit for speaking these words. It says the words of Samuel, not a false spirit or a lying spirit, but Samuel himself. Speaking of lying spirits, we have an example of a lying spirit up in heaven volunteering to lie through the mouths of Ahab's prophets, but God is very deliberate to allow a true prophet to let everyone know about it. You can read all about it in 1 Kings 22, but God made it clear. We don't have anything like that happening here. God didn't send a prophet to tell us that King Saul was seeing a lying spirit. Instead, we had clear language that said Samuel over and over again. Now I understand the other side of the argument. They'll quote the law from Leviticus and say God told them not to consult familiar spirits, and I would agree. King Saul shouldn't have done that. But let's face facts. It's not like King Saul did this and then got away scot-free. The best argument that they have for it being an evil spirit is that God had not been communicating with King Saul, so why start now, they'll say. And I would kind of agree with that. However, God sometimes allows things to happen for our benefit, even if it's painful. And King Saul was definitely pushing the issue. King Saul was in the wrong, and God allowed a man named Samuel to come up from the heart of the earth, Abraham's bosom, and prophesy one last time. You say, yeah, but God doesn't normally do this. Well, that's correct. He also doesn't normally let a donkey speak for her owner. But he allowed it one time. God wasn't breaking his law by allowing Samuel to speak from the dead. We are still forbidden to consult familiar spirits. Just because 99.9% .9 of the time a false lying spirit shows up and impersonates Uncle John and tells the gullible people things they want to hear, doesn't discount this biblical account of the prophet Samuel from speaking in 1 Samuel chapter 28. More than likely, this witch at Endor was used to tricking people in the past and had some sort of arrangement with a familiar spirit 
who would come and impersonate someone, but something seems to have gone wrong this time, and the witch realizes she truly does see Samuel, and it's quite a surprise. Earlier I mentioned that J. Vernon McGee and Matthew Henry didn't think this was Samuel. Well, I will say this for the other side of the argument, and I'm not alone. It's John Wesley who wrote in his commentary regarding the witch seeing Samuel, Saw Samuel, the words are express. The woman saw Samuel instead of the spirit whom she expected to see. God ordering it so for his own glory. She cried with a loud voice, terrified and astonished, and thence easily conjectured whom she had been talking with. Now, I don't need John Wesley to agree with me. I just threw that in there as kind of a little extra. My Bible says it was Samuel that was doing the talking. So I have a choice to make. Do I believe what it says and where it says it? Or do I say it was mistaken and should have worded it differently? This subject may cause some of you to want to break fellowship, especially if you take offense to me declaring that I'm aligning myself with the Bible, and if you disagree, then you're not believing the Bible. I've heard people that I know believe the Bible and identify themselves as Bible believers, yet they've disagreed on this issue. But there's nothing we can do about that. We're going to have disagreements. I made this video for anybody that was wondering just what to think in this regard and not to be overly argumentative. If it's made you think about things and still remain positive, then great. Remember, stick with the book.